What's up guys and welcome back to a very special episode of Headphones Neil Reviews and in this case as always I'm Headphones Neil but um, I wanted to get another episode out just because in planning some upcoming episodes I realized that it's about time for a Nosberry Farm visit so at the end of this episode I'll give a little bit of information as to the contents of that review but since I have enough stuff to review for this particular episode I thought I would get it out a little bit early so I can have that Nosberry Farm review out for you guys uh, later in the week or at the latest at the moment for the weekend. So to start it off I had a chance to finally watch Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 and overall I thought that the movie was okay. I tried to get over my personal bias of splitting up movies into multiple parts when they don't need to be. Um, the movie was a little bit on the longer side and there were a lot of points where you have characters standing around staring at each other, looking back and forth, trying to build up tension. But after the first couple of times, it kind of got repetitive and boring and to the point where it was like, okay, let's move this plot along quite a bit. So it feels like they kind of cut down on the movie um, a lot and it's not to say that they couldn't have still split up the movie into multiple parts but it felt like they could cut down on a good maybe 10 or 15 minutes because it felt like the movie was spaced out for the sake of splitting it up into two parts and even not to try and establish the whole plot line of this AI trying to uh, rewrite the truth um, you have different governments trying to take control of it and then you have the ongoing friction between Ethan Hunt and Kittredge. Um, getting a little bit of backstory on how Ethan joined the IMF even though I kind of would have preferred that they um, spend more time on that backstory than all the back and forth talking that they did. Um, so for that I'm gonna kind of hold off, my, hold off on my final judgment of the film until they release part two but my initial thought was that it was an okay installment in the Mission Impossible films but if they round it out well enough then I'll change my tune and give it a positive rating but for me it didn't seem like they needed to at the moment I'm gonna say they don't they didn't need to split it up into two parts but I will admit that that's my bias but they could have um, tightened up the length of the film quite a bit just to avoid all the staring around and talking and um, all of that stuff and then there's only so many times you can have Haley Atwell's character um, steal the key or whatever from Ethan and then he steals it back so it's like once or twice is fine but they did that I want to say it felt like over and over again so it felt like things like that were they were just extending the length of the film to make a particular um, length of the film and um, to kind of justify that length so um, with that being said, that's why I'm kind of giving it a grade of about a C plus to a B minus. It was okay. The plot that they introduced was good. So we'll see how they round it out in the next film. Um, I also had a chance to go back in time as far as watching old movies. I had a chance to watch Blackula. So I was um, browsing around on AMC plus looking for stuff to watch and the movie came across um, my timeline and I was thinking that I do remember hearing about the film you know think think of along the lines of maybe like a plan 9 from outer space um, it's not generally considered a great film but it's not a bad film it's a, definitely a film of its time and so I got to thinking that let me give it a watch see how it holds up in the grand scheme of like Dracula films and overall I want to say that it was a very enjoyable film um, you have um, and I'm going to say the guy's name wrong, so I'm going to just call him Blackula for simplicity. But you have him going to England, maybe the, yeah, to, or to um, Transylvania to talk to Dracula about ending the slave trade and then, and um, kind of stopping that. And you come to odds about the different points of view between Blackula and Dracula. 
And so Dracula ends up turning him into a vampire and putting him into a sleep only to wake up two year, 200 years later to find out that his uh, wife has been killed, but he finds a new lady who looks just like her. So kind of like a reincarnation of his uh, deceased wife and then dealing with all of that. So overall, I thought it was well done. Um, for the most part, you have a lot of the usual Dracula tropes. So he turns into a bat, he has his fangs, he's walking around in the cave, he's trying to um you know uh, have his wives and in general actually um more or less mimics what happens in the bram stoker or stoker 1931 dracula film but it brought into the modern times of the 70s when the film takes place so for me it generally just worked um the main thing that it was hard to portray was that dracula speed but you do have him showing his strength so it kind of makes up for it but after a little while, you realize that, you know, without, you know, things like CG or CG, without CGI or, you know, practical effects that make it look like he's walk moving faster than he is, um, it kind of doesn't come across very well. But because he has his strength, it works out. But um, that's why I say for me in general, I thought it was a very well made film to the point where I give it a grade of about, uh, I want to say maybe 85 to 90 percent. Um, the negatives were not anything particularly bad. Um, the only real bad thing I thought for me was the uh, guy who portrayed Dracula didn't really look like a Dracula type character. He looked more like a he looked generally like a, just a general, you know, England or English vampire. So think of like Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise from an interview with a vampire. So that kind of portrayal rather than a Dracula level portrayal so but then they cover that up or they make up for that in as blackula wore the whole cape and had the fangs and had that overall look so that's why it's like things like that they offset things with each other well so even though you think you're missing something they make it up somewhere else so um for me that's why i give it that grade of about an 85 to 90 percent and if you think about it as a modern day telling of um dracula in the 70s it generally does generally works and even though you have a lot of things that are like you know music of the time and the bar and the way that people talk it actually just it fits well and they didn't overdo it with a lot of that stuff so i think that's why it worked for me and then at, with a runtime of around like 85 or 90 minutes it wasn't particularly long so they kept everything moving and going the pacing was good and it kept my interest for the whole time um, so with that, I also had a chance to watch Fear the Walking Dead, so the latest episode in Season 8, so Episode 9, Sanctuary. So this deals a lot, are all around Dwight and I think his wife's, or ex-wife's name is Sherry. Um, this episode deals with them going back to the sanctuary. It starts off with Dwight getting, trying to find insulin for a guy, and then the guy ends up getting bit by a vampire, or not, by a zombie. Sorry, getting my shows mixed up a little bit. Um, and then dealing with these new guys who are now living in the sanctuary, and them having to deal with it. But it ultimately is a stepping stone episode for Dwight and Sherry to move past the trauma that they experienced at the sanctuary and go back to help um, um, the people that need their help right now to honor their uh, son's memory so that um, other people don't suffer that same fate. So overall, a generally well-produced well episode. I really liked it. How it factors into everything else, we'll see, but it still felt like that stepping stone episode to bring Dwight and Sherry back into the fold, or most notably Dwight back into the fold of the show. So you have all your main characters going after Padre and Troy, so we'll see how it goes, but I thought the episode was good as a standalone episode, and we'll see how it factors into the rest of the season. And now to round out this particular episode, um, I did have a chance to finally start playing Doom 3, so I'm still in the early stages and I haven't had a chance to get into any um, combat, but I did have a chance to, you know, go through the welcome screen, get my PDA, um, meet up with the sergeant who gave me the first mission of finding the um, scientists in the communications tower. So as of this episode, I have gotten as far as the communications tower. I find out that there's random things going on with um, things like um, random noises and events happening, um, people being transferred off the base, uh, you have uh, Petruger and 
the committee member at Oz about what's going on and the whole thing with damage control. So um, overall, a good, interesting start to the game. Um, so far, I'm liking that they're integrating gameplay with the story mechanics. So you kind of have a uh, running story of what's happening rather than, you know, title cards at the end of each episode like you had in Doom 1 and 2. So um, general... Mi not misgivings, but general um, dislikes of people, of people, or what dislikes people had when the first game first came out. That was more horror based. It doesn't really follow, follow the formula of the first two games. For me, at the moment, um, based on this initial stuff, I'm actually liking that they're integrating the story into the game, so you know what's going on right off the bat, and you're working your way into the game as a whole. So I can't wait to see what happens for the rest of the game. Um, I will admit that I've only gotten in, into the game as far as finding the scientist in the communications tower, um, the health spawn portal coming into coming onto Mars, and then starting to head back to the base. And I think that's really about it. I don't remember much beyond that, so we'll see if I got any further or what if I remember anything else, but I don't remember getting too far into the game, mostly because my system specs at the time were not that great. So um, I think playing it just it got really janky and then it fell apart just because I wasn't up to that game. But for me now, um, now that I have played, you know, Doom 2016, Doom 64, uh, Dooms 1 and 2, of course, and various mods, I think I'm in a better place now than I was at the time. You know, jumping right into Doom 3 without having played any of the other Doom games adds that level, or there's no, not enough learning curve to get into the game, so uh, look out for that. Um, it's the, the, the playlist and the videos are up on the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash PatelN01. Um, so definitely subscribe if you want to stay up to date on that stuff. Um, and then of course with this podcast, it's up a little bit early, so I'm just pushing everything out um as fast as i can so just not so um not as long as uh, most episodes or anything like that and then of course for the loki season finale i'll have that on um next week's episode so it'll be a little bit longer of a wait for that review but look out for that um next week um i have also been watching or continuing to watch um stargate atlantis so just staying on top of that they've kind of moved they're kind of switching back and forth and moving over into the replicators a little bit more. So um, I'm up to the point where they that where they find out that Replicator Weir is alive and that they've all been cloned and Atlantis has been cloned too. So it's kind of weird. Like they they're not really picking their lane. It feels like as far as dealing with the Wraith or the Replicators, and then dealing with the loss of Weir and having Cap or Colonel Carter there and all of that. So. For me, I think that's probably why I didn't get into the show that much, that it tried to do a lot of different things and intertwine it a little, a little bit too much. So um, we'll see how the rest of the season goes in, into season five, but I'm still in the middle of about season four right now. So I'm still watching um, that. So that's all there is for this particular episode. So as far as the Knott's Berry Farm episode for this month, um, so originally it was just going to be, um, I want to see just the next list of top 10 things. Um, so uh, kind of either Thanksgiving related stuff or just more downtime related things. So, you know, 10 unique things for the park. But last week, as it turns out, um, Cedar Fair and um, Six Flags came to an agreement to merge the two companies. Um, but from what I can tell, they're going to keep the parks and existing um, amusement parks, I guess, really um, unique and separate and all that and not really merge or intertwine things or change things up too much. So assuming that I would figure for this month's episode that I would do a top 10 things of what I think Knott's Berry Farm should keep the same and uh, things that can be improved or changed or updated with the partnership with Six Flags. So granted i haven't been to six flags in many years so i don't remember too much theming for you know par areas of a park going on but the rides were themed so you know when you go on the batman or batman the ride that area is themed the riddler superman goliath x2 like all the individual rides are 
very well themed, but there's nothing really cohesive to theme certain areas of the park. Like you don't have a um, DC area. Well, I mean, technically it's, I guess, a DC area, but it's like Superman the Rise not really close to, from my memory of it, to the Riddler ride or Batman ride. So um, there's a bit of a walk there. And then you have like um, the Ninja ride in the middle of the park. So it's kind of all over the place, but it doesn't mean that it's necessarily a bad thing. And it can be a two-way street that the theming of knots can be scaled up into um, uh, Six, Flags, Six Flags Magic Mountain, for example, to theme areas of the park based on um, location or sector. And because uh, Six Flags Magic Mountain has a bigger um, side, the park itself is bigger, you have more room to have bigger theming. So um, all of that I'm planning to have and a further analysis and opinion in my that next episode. So. Um, look out for that and of course it all is, it is all going to be an opinion piece just personal thoughts on that so just top 10 things that can be changed merged and ideas that they can use to share with each other to improve both parks and I'm going to use knots as a base since I've been there more often lately six flags I haven't been and I want to say at least 15 years or maybe more 15 for sure so I'm relaying it on my memory of what happened years ago or how the park looked years ago so um I'll kind of give my general ideas of things that, that can be shared, but um, look out for that coming later this week. But that is all for this particular episode. Thanks for tuning in, and until next time.